Hi guys, I'm Laura and welcome to a new video. <sighs> Today's video is going to be about the city of brass. The city of brass story is or brass is, is a part of um, the collection of the Arabian Nights. I personally have never heard about this specific story before. And as I was first listening to it and then reading through it, I recognized a lot of very interesting elements to that story. And I think it is a true story. So a couple of days ago, when I came across the city of brass myth or legend, I decided to make a video on it. And yesterday I discovered a new series. I think it is on Amazon and um, it is called the wheel of time and i can only recommend to watch that series if you are interested in the world of uh, jrl tolkien if you are interested in ancient ancient civilizations and the periods after the fall of certain civilizations I recognized a lot of uh, themes that that I have already ha that I already have um, learned about, and especially one element was really really interesting, and that was that they also had a gigantic, walled, abandoned, ghostly city. And I do think that the author, because it is um, the series is based on a on a book trilogy, on, on a book, on, on a couple of books, I think. Um, the author was definitely inspired by the city of brass. Um, so yeah, let's dive into the very strange elements of the city of brass. All right, you guys. So before we start with the main story, I wanted to show you a couple of um, pictures of this cursed abandoned city from the Wheel of Time. As I said, it is uh, very similar to how it has been described in the Arabian Nights. So as we can see here, there is this gigantic wall that has been built around the city and the place is completely abandoned just like a skeleton of a place and also there are no insects no birds no life at all within its walls and this is something that i've heard quite often about old places and this is also some of the reason why the natives of that place don't go there. It's haunted and there is no life existing there. So people shouldn't go near it. And oftentimes when that's the case, well, um, to me, if I look at it psychically, it looks like a, like a dark whirlpool. So because of the things that happened there and the energy that kind of built up there over time, and depending, of course, on the intensity of the things happened there, it creates like this black wormhole and nothing alive will go near that. Um, so yeah, the story basically of this city is that they were the richest, most wealthiest, and they are they promised help to a certain peoples when um in the case that they got attacked by trolls, trollics, which to me look like genetic experiments. So they denied their help, of course, and they basically built this wall around them in paranoia, hoarded all their riches, and then a unknown thing, some people say evil itself, um, 
just basically an- annihilated the city and its its people. I will not go through the whole story. Um, one of the reasons being that it has a ton of invocations and blessings and yeah, I would call them invocations to certain people of history and gods and things like that. So um, that's not something that I wanna that I wanna speak out loud. And I'm just gonna point out some of the places and happenings that were that might you know uh, sound a little bit familiar to what people have been researching and I myself have been uh, seeing all around the ro- the world. Um, but I'm gonna just set the stage really quickly. So the story is about a voyage that um, the people that went on the, on the voyage came from the Arabic lands and they got off track and landed basically on the continent of Africa. And then they um, suddenly, like completely unexpectedly, discovered that there were these bottles of brass that King Solomon um, concealed gins into, different kinds of gins, very powerful ones. And how he did that was by pouring molten, molten lead inside them and concealed them in brass bottles Um, and sealed them with his seal. So they basically then make some arrangements with the the local people um, and the local king and go on to look for the specific city of brass to uh, get more of these bottles. Now, I don't believe that's set up at all. The story basically starts in Damascus where a commander talks to his closest man and then one of them and then they come to the topic of King Solomon and then one of them tells the story of this voyage um, and uh, his grandfather was involved in that but the guy who tells the story is a treasure hunter and he hunts for treasures beneath the earth so this whole setup is very sus to me um, also, like I said, there's very much um, propaganda and invocation towards a certain deity and ter- towards a certain bloodline in that story. It's like all over the place. Um, but I don't buy that they just, you know, happened to come across this place and then suddenly someone got this brass bottle out of the ocean and they opened it and a gin came out and they were just like, oh, I think, you know, our commander or prince or whatever would like to see these gins of King Solomon. No, 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 from the conversation, from the start, from the beginning, um, it is very clear that these people are worshiping King Solomon and that he is a very, very important figure for them. So, um, yeah, it's it's all told like very lightheartedly and I don't buy that at all. I think they were looking for that. As throughout throughout our story, um people are looking for artifacts that hold special powers and things like that. Another part of that beginning I find super interesting is the fact how he captured them. I never heard of that. But um, Indigo Angel, on her channel, she talked about um, the Vatican. And I'm going to have a talk with her in about two weeks, I think. Uh, And Sonia Testament about all the dark stuff happening and how that system actually works. And one of the things that the Vatican has is a seal. And it is a lead seal. Uh, Lead was used as... Um, lead has been used for seals for quite a long time Um, but it is interesting because in the story there will be a god emerging from the sea and we know the story of the fish gods from the Dogons who are from the African continent and the Pope is connected to that fish god and the Christian 
church, the Catholic church, um, is connected to that, and he also has his uh, lead sealed ring. So I think lead probably plays a, a part in um, how the dark ones are consolidating their power and sealing it. Okay, let's get into some of the descriptions about the places they found. As we all know and are fascinated by these walled cities and palaces and gone civilizations, this is the first thing they came across on their journey. And then there appeared to them in the distance some great thing, high and black, in whose midst was as it were smoke rising to the confines of the sky. They made for this and stayed not in their course till they drew near when, behold, it was a high castle, firm of fashion and great and gruesome, as it were a lofty mountain, built all of black stone, with frowning battlements and a door of gleaming china steel that dazzled the eyes and dazed the wit. Round about it were a thousand steps, and in its midst, and in its midst was a dome of lead, a thousand cubits high, which appeared afar off as it were smoke. Now again, here we have lead. We have a castle that is made out of black stone and is high as a mountain in the middle of the desert. And then they basically go in and the whole moral and lesson of the story um, is, is that uh, greed will bring you nothing, all the riches of the world will bring you nothing if you are cold-hearted and um, if you just hoard things. And that's why I also connected it to this uh, abandoned city in, city in the Wheel of Time because it is about this extreme hoarding of riches. And we also actually, I remember that that uh, was a theme in the Oyera Linda book, when they talk about a people that basically starved themselves and their children to death because all they focused all they were focused on were i know uh clothing and and jewelry and luxury items but they didn't took care of you know plowing the fields and taking care of food supply so they basically vanished because of their greed, their greed. So this is the, the topic um, running through this whole story. And also what we get oftentimes in the Arabian Nights and in other stories are these um, these things of, of power, these uh, swords and knives and crowns that are found and they're not meant to be touched they they are cursed and yeah people died there are different objects but yeah this theme is also very um very prominent in our world the next thing that they come across is in my opinion the weirdest um yes these places are amazing and mysterious but this is something else and you will understand why so i'm gonna read you a little bit more this time out of what is actually said because it's highly fascinating i think so they didn't know which way to go and there was this horseman made out of brass and it said on a tablet in his hands i think um that if you want to know the way to the city of brass well do something so the emir accordingly rubbed the horseman's hand and he revolved like the dazzling lightning and stopped 
facing in a direction other than that wherein they were journeying. journeying. So uh, moving brass statues. So they took the road to which he pointed and finding it a beaten track, fared on days and nights till they came to a pillar of brass. Wherein was one sunken up to his armpits. So they found this pillow of brass in which a being was captured and he was sunken into it up to his armpits. The creature had two great wings and four arms, two like men's arms and other two as they were lion's paws, with claws of iron, and he was black and tall, with hair like horses' tails and eyes like blazing coals. Moreover, he had a third eye, as it were that of a lynx, in the middle of his forehead, from which flew sparks of fire, and he cried out, Glory to my Lord, who hath adjudged unto me this uh, grievous punishment, blah, 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 until the day of resurrection. When the folk saw him, they lost their reason for a fright and turned to flee. So they basically, um, yeah, were very, very surprised, very frightened and just wanted to get away from him. Um, but then basically they sent someone to talk to him. So they asked him his name and uh, the reason why he was captured in this uh, in this pillar. And he says, I am Afrit of the Jinn. My name is Dahish, son of El Amish, and I am confined here by way of punishment, um, by the judgment of the Al Almighty, until he releases me. And then they ask him why he is imprisoned in this column. And now I'm just gonna uh, summarize a little bit until I read on. So basically, there was this very, very um, powerful king that had an idol made out of made out of red carnelian, and this idol was in the shape of this jinn, and he worshipped that idol. So the jinn would come into the idol and um, basically give him uh, a lot of power over other jinns. So they basically had like this huge. Um, this huge army and this uh, person who had this power had this red carnelian idol was a prince of the sea a prince of great power and prowess ruling over a thousand thousand warriors of the jinn and the jinn that was captured in the column was their chief and these jinns were all rebels against solomon now what happened? This um, prince of the sea that had the carnelian idol who had a lot of power had a, had a daughter, a beautiful daughter that always tended to the idol and had a close relationship with it. So what did King Solomon do? He demanded her. He demanded her. He wanted her to become his wife and um, he demanded it and he also demanded that the prince of the sea destroyed the carnelian um, idol of course um, and so there yeah there was this 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 fight um, that soon happened between the prince of the sea and solomon and basically there was no difference between them two um, <laughs> it's just a biased story that, you know, prefers Solomon. But basically Solomon was, you know, quite, it was, it is quite offensive to, you know, uh, tell another man to give him your daughter and destroy basically all of your power and just hand it over to him. Um, so they had this great battle and, um, another really interesting Thing that they mention here is that um, Solomon had also a jinn army 
that he had an army of men and jinn and birds and beasts and reptiles. And reptiles are mentioned here a couple of times. I just find it really interesting. Well, in the end, of course, uh, the Prince of the Sea was defeated because Solomon had bigger jinns. <laughs> and then he captured him in this column. And how he did it, he how he did it was he he made this ho uh, and how he did it was he made this hollow column, chained the gin, and poured lead into it. So again, lead is a very important element of sealing and concealing. And then finally, they come to the city of brass. And the city of brass is also described as a massive black walled city with twin fires. And it is described in the book of hidden treasures. Its walls are of black stone and it has two towers of Andalusian brass which in a distance appear to be twin fires. And this is why it is named the city of brass. And there are a lot of um, very intricate descriptions of how rich, how rich and luxurious, luxurious the city still was when they arrived there. All of the people dead, um, which is interesting because in the Wheel of Time, you don't see any people. You don't see, you don't even see skeletons. But how it is described in this, it's like, it's like actually they were mummified. It is also said that people lay dead in front of their shops, and um, yeah, it's like, it's like this this mist came over them, and they just suddenly all died. And again, it is talked about, you know, the greed and all of the things, the dominance, the power, the women, that nothing really can um, save you from death and from the punishment of God and things like that. But um, yeah, the descriptions are really interesting, like how, how rich this place uh, is. But yeah, that didn't help. Um, I'm just realizing that I did a astral project projection. I shared that on my Patreon. But um, what was interesting about that is also that I saw this material, this black stone, uh, which for me was obsidian, um, obsidian crystal. And um, yeah, there was a structure inside a mountain under the ocean or in on the ocean bottom on the bottom of the ocean um, that was, I think, I talked, I described it way more, but what it basically was, was a portal um, made out of just different crystals and water and things like that. But one of the main components was obsidian. I mean, not from, for the Mayans and a lot of ancient people, um, obsidian was uh, very important. In the end of the story, Again, something really weird happens, and I don't really quite understand it, really, um, because it was said that they were set out. It was said they were, you know, set out to look for these vessels, but um, they actually didn't take anything from the city of Brass, just one table, I think. Um, but that they didn't look or find any of these vessels. Also, in the beginning, the king they first met said that these brass bottles are in the sea. So, um, yeah, after the city of brass, they moved on. And then again, they came to a high mountain. And again, there were uh, black people all around and none, none of them spoke Arabic. Um, but the king and the king came and... Um, the funny thing is they they asked each other if they are jinn. 
So it's not very really clear if jinns are just very magical, powerful people. Um, I mean, yeah, just go and check out the Wheel of Time and you will understand that, I mean, psychic abilities, magic, um, all of these kinds of witchcraft, all of these kinds of stuff uh, was very, very active <laughs> on the earth. But anyhow, so they ask each other if they are man or jinn. Um, and the travelers said, no, we are men. But then he said, but doubtless you are jinn, you must be jinn, by the vastness of your statue and your dwelling apart in this mountains that is cut off from mankind. So he basically says that they are very, very tall. Uh, and he said, no, we are also children of Adam, of the lineage of Ham son of Noah and then uh, the Arabic people asked them what they worship what is their religion and uh, the black king says that they worship the god of the heavens and he says our religion is that of Muhammad and then of course they asked them how how they got this knowledge and they asked him if a prophet inspired by the god had visited the country um, and the king replied know o amir that there appeared to us aforetime from out the sea a man from whom issued a light that illu illuminated the whole horizon and he cried out in a voice that was heard afar and near saying o children of ham Bow down to him who seeth and is not seen and say, There is no God but God, blah, 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 and Muhammad and blah, blah, blah. And then the king goes on to say that before this, we used to worship one another. But he called us to the service of the Lord of all, all creatures. And then, of course, he taught them to repeat a certain phrase, which, again, I'm not going to read because it's an invocation. Um, yeah, that's why I am not subscribing to anything, because I don't give my power away to any lord or ascended master or <laughs> E.T. or alternative community something. I don't know. I just, no. I'm interested in individuals and um, in sovereignty and the light within. Um, and yeah, I just found that to be interesting. So then the travelers want to have some, still want to have some of these uh, brass vessels with the gins in it. And they get them for him out of the sea, 12. And then basically they come home and the prince takes the bottles and just opens them and that's it so just for fun this all this journey all of this thing just just for fun he doesn't want to use the gins it's it's also not like it's it's not weird at all that actually their their beloved solomon you know sealed these gins in there and they just let them out it's just like phew. Doesn't matter, but King Solomon is, of course, the the greatest. But you don't respect his decision, and you don't think he had reasons to capture the jinns in these vessels. So yeah, like I said, all of the um, <laughs> the motivation for all of this is really weird. Um, it's a big piece of uh, invocation and propaganda, but. Um, yeah, I shared with you the parts that I found most interesting and that reminded me of a lot that uh, we are looking into in terms of our story. So yeah, guys, that's it. I hope uh, you liked the video. Um, leave me a like, leave me your thoughts down in the comments and hopefully see you in the next one. Have a nice day. Bye bye.